In this video today, we're going to be looking at lab tests that involve complement. And our goal is to be able to explain different laboratory techniques used in the monitoring of the complement proteins. So when we look at complement tests, there are two different measurements that we can get from these tests. The first one is how many or how much of this particular complement protein is present, so it's quantitative. And we can also measure how well the complement system is functioning. Is this protein functional? Is it non-functional? Is it overly functional? That kind of thing. And there's a series of different techniques that we can use to monitor these two things. One of them being RID, radial immunodiffusion, nephilometry, hemolytic titration, and the ELISA test. So let's take a closer look at these. RID stands for radial immunodiffusion and in this kind of test if you're looking for complement proteins what you'll have is you basically have a gel that has embedded in it antibodies specific for the complement protein you're looking for. What you'll do is you will take the patient's serum and we're assuming that it has complement in it at this point they weren't totally deficient and you'd add it to a little hole in the gel. What will happen is when you add the serum in, the complement proteins, which in this case are acting as the antigen, will diffuse out into the gel. And the antibodies for that protein will react with the complement that's in there. So the amount of complement that you have in your serum will drive the diffusion of this, this ring, the creation of this ring. And the wider the diameter, it's basically proportional to the concentration of complement that you have. Now remember, the antibodies that could be in the gel would be specific for a particular complement antigen. So you wouldn't know exactly how much you have of every complement protein, but you might know, for example, how much you have of C9 or C3 or something along those lines. So here you can see the less you have, the smaller the rings are. As the antigen concentration goes up, which in this case is complement protein, the diameter squared will go up as well. The diameter goes up, obviously. And you can see what happens is the antibodies and antigen will form this precipitin ring that you can measure. And if you were in BL2410, you'll remember this because you did do it at one point in time. Nephilometry is very similar to spectrophotometry, except it's going to be measuring light scattering rather than transmittance and absorb absorbance. So what you do is you mix your patient serum, which again would have the complement proteins in it, and you mix it with an antibody specific for the protein you want to analyze in a solution. You put that solution into the nephilometer, and it will basically see how light scatters in proportion to how many antigen and antibody complexes are formed. So the more reaction you have, the more complement you've got in the serum, the more it's going to mix with the antibody that's been prepared, the more complexes are formed, and the more the light is going to scatter. Hemolytic titration is a little bit trickier, and we're not going to go into specifics. But in this case, what we're looking at is the end result of complement, which is the lysis of cells. So what you would do is you would make varying dilutions of the patient's serum, and you would mix those dilutions with sensitized red blood cells. And sensitized red blood cells are red blood cells that have been coated with an antibody. Now remember, antibody binding to a cell is one of the triggers for the classical cascade. That's what's going to trigger the complement proteins to do their job. So if you have a lot of complement proteins and you expose them to a cell that's been coated in antibody, they're going to proceed just like normal and cause lysis of the cell. This will help when you're, when you're measuring this. What you're going to be looking for is the amount of serum that it takes to burst 50% of the red blood cells. And this is going to help to kind of look at you know, overly active complement systems. If you have a very weak dilution, but it's still capable of lysing 50% of the red cells, that indicates that you probably have a very, very concentrated serum full of, of complement proteins, or very active. You might have to take it a step further to figure out which of those two situations is going on. If you have a deficient protein, however, in your complement cascade, you're not going to see any lysis at all because it's not going to be initiated. You can do this for both the alternative and classical cascade. Um, however, you change it a little bit with the, the red cells you use and the reagents that you use because 
we know the alternative and the classical have different triggers. So I don't expect you to know the big difference, but just understand the idea behind a hemolytic titration. So this can be done, as I said, for the alternative and classical pathways. The ELISA test, or enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, is commonly used in all sorts of tests in the clinical lab. Again, if you were in BL2410, you would be familiar with this because we did a lot of tests with it. And how this works is you have an antibody that is specific for a certain protein of complement, and you fix it to a solid support. So here you could see it could be the inside of a micro titer well, it could be on a filter paper, it could be a lot of different things, but it's, it's there and it's stuck there. And what you will do is you will add the patient serum again, you would assume with the complement that in it that you're looking for, or maybe not, I guess it depends on what you're looking for, if you think that might be low or high. But either way, we're gonna assume you're adding serum with complement to it. And the complement, as you can see down here, will be bound by this antibody because it is specific for this particular complement protein. Now that's not all that fancy. The next step is where we start to see the, the color changing happening in this type of test. And so what you will do is after you have added the patient's serum, you'll do a wash step and get rid of all the extra complement, but then you're gonna add a second antibody that is labeled with some sort of indicator it could be an enzyme like alkaline phosphatase. Um, you could probably do this with radio, or excuse me, with immunofluorescence. But either way, you have a second antibody that is also specific for complement here, this complement protein, but it has an indicator on it. So in the next step, when we add a substrate to it, this little indicator, which in many times is an enzyme, will act upon the substrate if it has been bound by this complement protein, and it will cause a color change. So the more, the more complement you have that gets bound, the more of this second antibody will be bound. The more second antibody you have bound, the greater the color change is gonna be because you're gonna have more of this enzyme present to cause a color change to that substrate that you're going to add. So we're gonna come back to this because there's a lot of different ways we can tweak the ELISA test and use it in serology, but have a general understanding of how this kind of works. The last lab test that we're going to talk about is complement fixation, and it's different from the other tests because in this case, we're not actually looking to see if the patient's complement is functioning correctly. We're using complement as a reagent in this test. So what we're actually going to be looking for is the presence of a particular antibody, or we could also look for the presence of a particular antigen. And we'll talk about how that's done. So you can see this picture here. What you will do is let's say, for example, we're looking for the presence of a particular antibody in a patient, okay? You'll take the patient's serum and you will mix it with the antigen for the antibody you're looking at. And if the patient has the antibody, they will bind, right? That's just natural. So you add the patient serum, again, we're looking at antibody here, to a pre-made commercial antigen and you incubate it. If the antibody is in the serum, it will bind to the antigen. Then we add complement to the mixture. And remember that complement proteins are going to bind to antibodies, right? That's one of the things, as we said before, that triggers their binding and activation. So if there has been an antibody complex formed, the complement will bind to the antibodies. If they have the antibodies, the complement will bind to it. Let's say that. So you add the complement. You incubate it again. Then you add again some sensitized red cells. So these are cells that have been coated with antibody. Let's take the path on the left here. If there has been an antigen antibody reaction, so if you did have the antibody for the antigen you were looking for, it will bind up the complement. That means that there's no complement free to lyse these red cells. So these cells will not burst, which means you, this is a positive test. Yes, you had the antibody we were looking for. We know because it bound to the antigen and it also bound to the complement, and that means that there's no complement left to burst the cells. On the other hand, if you have antigen and antibody that don't bind, they aren't specific for each other, so you don't have the antibody 
that, you, that you're looking for, for this antigen, the complement will still be free, and instead it will bind to the antibodies on this red cell and cause it to burst. So it's a little bit backwards, but if you have lysis of the red cells that you add, that means there was free complement, and that also means that you don't have the antibody in question. If there was no lysis, it means that there was no free complement because it was bound by the antibody you were looking for, therefore the red cells stay intact. It's a little bit backwards, think through it a couple times, and then we can talk about it in class. So the goal was to explain different lab techniques used in the monitoring of complement proteins. Hopefully we have accomplished this. By all means, feel free to ask questions in class, shoot me an email, or give me some feedback.